Biosensor toward point of care medical diagnosis. Long title. And that's my research. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to share my research with you guys. Okay. So I want to start this presentation with a definition of biosensor. What is a biosensor? It might be easier to read because this is definition. There's nothing I can add into it because this is a definition. A biosensor is an analytical device composed of biological recognition element with a transducer to produce a measurable signal proportional to amount of energy. This is important because the amount of energy eventually can be used as an indicator of certain disease. So biosensors is really important for medical diagnosis. As I mentioned, this is very common, typical structure of biosensor. We have biological recognition elements, also known as bioreceptor. And types of bioreceptor molecules are enzymes, antibodies, and nucleic acid, and cells. And those are designed specifically for certain analysts of interest. So if you look at this on the left side, this is kind of the illustration of you know, multiple different types of biomolecules in the sample fluid. For example, like your blood, you know, these different uh, shape indicating there are different types of biomolecules in your blood. And these bioreceptor molecules designed specifically uh, to capture certain analytes in your sample fluid there. And in this case, I think this you know, red color shape that matches with the bioreceptor molecule. Those <coughs> molecules, those uh, specific analytes can reach the surface and bind to that the bioreceptor molecule there. And this binding event become measurable signal through the transducer. 
and eventually that becomes electric signal, and that electric signal translated uh, to be the certain concentration, certain amount of the, you know, the analog you are interested in. So using the biosensor, you can detect certain analogs, and you can find the you know, concentration of that. And we want to use that as an indicator of certain disease. What is the, you know, the most common, well-known you know, uh, examples of biosensors? These two are the very well-known biosensors. One is pregnancy test. It detects certain protein in urine. And if you have certain level, you know, higher level of the, you know, this protein in your urine, that means you're pregnant. Blood glucose monitoring device is really well known. You can see that from Walmart. If you go to Walmart, that if you go to that, you know, the section there, that you can find that a lot of different uh, uh, products that can be used for uh, monitoring blood glucose level. This is really, really important for the diabetic patient because they use this pretty much day and night to monitoring their health. And these are pretty much well-known biosensors. You know this, right? You've seen, you've seen this before, right? These are biosensors. But there are different types of biosensors, maybe more important than those two, or maybe the you know, almost same importance of that, those two. One of them I want to bring your attention is enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, which is also known as ELISA, E-L-I-S-A. And that is commonly used for the blood test, and then measures the concentration of the antigen biomarkers in a blood sample. This is the uh, image of the most, I mean, one of the recent uh, automatic, automatic uh, analysis ELISA system developed by Hamilton. And you can imagine that you know, the, this system can do a lot of different work, but it's a really expensive system. So as I mentioned here, that you know, this ELISA can detect and measure the concentration of antigen biomarkers. And you may question that the, what is a biomarker? Biomarker is a measurable indicator of certain disease. For example, this table shows different biomarkers for different types of cancers. What that means is, if you have breast cancer, these are the biomolecules in your bloodstream that have been a higher concentration. By detecting those biomarkers, the concentration, if, you, uh, if one can detect it in a higher concentration of those biomarkers, that, means that is indication of that you have breast cancer. The same thing for other cancers. There are different biomarkers that already have been identified for those different cancers. And PSA might be that, you know, the one of the most well-known you know, uh, biomarker because that, you know, the, if you're male and age older than 50 years old, if you go to uh, annual exam, uh, then you need to uh, draw a lot of blood and then you have to send it to that, you know, certain uh, place for the analysis. And you know, that person has to go through that, you know, this uh, PSA screening process because that, you know, the, you're at the age of that, you know, the uh, risk of that, you know, prostate cancer. P PSA stands for the prostate-specific antigen. And if you have you know, the higher level of the PSA level, then that means that you have, you have a high chance to have a prostate cancer. So different types of biomarkers. These are the uh, four biomarkers used for the you know, heart disease. So by looking at the uh, concentration of the, you know, those biomarkers, you can actually use it to uh, diagnose the uh, heart disease and the condition of that. And also even you can actually that, you know, predict that you know, the possible heart attack within the next 24 or 48 hours by looking at those biomarkers. Other types of biomarkers for different diseases have been developed and uh, identified uh, in the bloodstream. So uh, you know, these are the, just some. It's not full, you know, complete list of the, you know, the biomarkers. But as you can see here, there are a bunch of biomarkers that have been identified that is become uh, as an indicator of the you know, different types of uh, diseases. So how ELISA can detect those kind of uh, biomarker? This is the sequence of the, you know, the how the ELISA actually processed to detect a certain biomarker in your blood sample there. And there are different types of ELISA, but you know, at this time I want to go over the sandwich-based ELISA because that is very common in these days. So sandwich ELISA, you know, the first step is that you, know, you have to prepare your, sound, uh, your uh, container uh, by putting that in a certain antibody specifically designed for that the antigen you want to detect. So for example, you want to detect the PSA, that then you have to put that in the anti-PSA inside of your container and put that in that, uh, that antibody so that it is code the, around that in a container there. And then you introduce your sample there, then the, uh, the antigen in the sample will attach to that, you know, that antibody using the uh, antigen antibody that in the affinity there. And after that, we rinse so that then the, whatever the leftover can go away. 
and we introduce another uh, antibody, with the, the uh, second antibody that is also tagged with the enzyme there. And then we actually introduce that in a substrate that has that in a, the uh, affinity with a certain enzyme. And there is some reaction happen between that in a substrate and enzyme. The substrate the enzyme interaction will create color change. So by looking at the thing how color change, that can be translated into that in the concentration of certain biomarkers you're, you're looking for. So that is very well developed technology and that has been used a lot. In what is the advantage of the ELISA? The advantage of ELISA are the high sensitivity. It is known for that in the, uh, for the PSA detection. Uh, the sensitivity of the ELISA is, uh, the detection limit of that in the uh, process specific antigen is less than one picomolar. So very, very high sensitivity and also very high selectivity, which is very, very important for the biosensor. So, so far so good. So we have good, very accurate, in high sensitivity, high selectivity biosensor, which can be used to monitor your health, to identify certain diseases you may have, like the cancers, or heart, heart disease, or kidney disease, or uh, arch tumor, or whatever it is, okay? Then what is the problem? That, you know, well, I mean, before we talk about the problem, let's talk about you know, the importance of health monitoring. Hundreds of thousands of deaths uh, are happening in each year uh, from the treatable disease. I mean, this is that, you know, the, a very important uh, information and the fact. And early detection is that, you know, the key factor to increase that in survival rate. And this graph shows five years survival rate and uh, for different cancer stage when the, the patient finds that they are cancer. So, for example, uh, we have four different cancer cases here. But if you look at the breast cancer, if the patient finds the breast cancer in stage one, the survival rate, five-year survival rate is 100%. But if the patient finds that in a breast cancer in a later stage, like a stage four, the survival rate becomes just only 22%. So you can see that in a, how obvious it is that early detection will increase the survival rate, and that is that in a, the key uh, a part of the, in a, the uh, proper treatment of that in a certain, uh, those kind of cancer patients. Problem is, the issue is, we know that in a, the early detection will you know, improve that in a survival rate, but still many patients find their cancer or their disease in a later stage. So that's the problem. So as you can see here, this in pie chart there, this is for the lung cancer case. You can find that, you know, the patient with lung cancer find their cancer typically in later stage. 72% find that their cancer later stage. So meaning that, you know, they lost the chance to be treated and survive after five years treatment. But other cancers is a little bit better in the U.S., but still, you know, that is the, you know, the significant, significant problem, and that is concern. It is even worse in the third world country. It has turned out that third world countries are even worse. You know, more than 75% of all the cancer patients in the third world country, countries are diagnosed at a late stage, meaning they pretty much, when they find it, they die, because there is no way that they can treat uh, those cancers typically. So that is the issue. So why is the problem that, you know, that we know the early detection will save your life? And there is a you know, the good biosensor you can use at the high sensitivity, high selectivity, right? You can use it, and you can find it, and you can, you can be treated, and then you can, you can survive. Well, what's the problem? The problem is typically that you, know, you go to doctor's office or clinic when you are sick, you know, when you feel something, right? And that, you know, the, that, that is a you know, the, typically the problem. And, when you go to doctor's office, then doctor examine you, you, examining you, and then you uh, give him blood, you know, then he will send the blood to the, you know, the uh, central white laboratory, and then do the, you know, the process to see that, you know, what kind of disease you may have and things like that. Or that, you know, even if that, you, know, the, you go to uh, doctor's office you know, once in a year for a uh, physical exam and things like that and do the blood test once a year, even so, this is just once a year. That might not be really, uh, uh, you know, Kind of that, you know, the often enough that you, know, you can actually that monitor your health more uh, closely. So basically, that, you know, this entire system that you, know, you go to the doctor's office and draw blood and you know, wait for the result, and then you, uh, your insurance company pay a lot of money for that, you know, all the diagnosis and the, uh, all those kind of biosensing uh, procedures. So overall, that, you know, this whole process is the inefficient, expensive, and time consuming, meaning it's an inconvenient. That's the problem. If you know that you know, early detection will save your life, that you, know, you have biosensor, you can actually be monitoring your health, you may do it, but you may not do it right now because that, you know, it's just inconvenient. You, know, you don't have time to go there, you, know, you don't have insurance to do that, you know, the, you know, that kind of the uh, medical exam and that kind of thing. 
So because of that, that you know, the, there is still a lot of people find that you know, there is disease at a later stage, and that causes you know, a lot of trouble. Same thing for the third world country. I mean, they don't have, I mean, we are blessed in the U.S. You know, we have resources there. I mean, even if that, you know, the, it is expensive and time consuming, if we want, we can go and then we can <coughs> give our blood. That, you know, they, can, they can process the blood to detect that, you know, certain biomarkers in the blood to examine your health. But third world country, there is no such resource available. So therefore, that, you know, that there's not many options for the third world country. So what that means is that we need a better solution. So that is our problem statement for my research. So in this end, you know, we wanted to develop a point of care biosensor for medical diagnosis to monitor health status. So what does point of care biosensor mean? Point of care biosensor means like the biosensor we just uh, went over that as an example, like that in you know, the blood glucose sensor. You don't have to go to the doctor's office to uh, check your, your blood glucose level, right? You can have that device that can measure and detect that, you know, the level of the blood glucose in your blood at, at your home, and then you can check your blood glucose level anytime you want. That is, I think, what that means at the point of care biosensor. Imagine if you're a diabetes patient and you need to check your <coughs> blood glucose level uh, often, like day and night. To do that, if you need to go to the doctor's office every time you need to do it, that is very inconvenient, isn't it? That will be disaster, and there will be a lot of problems with that. The same thing. I think same thing happens, that you know, people just really detect that you know, the cancer or other diseases early, early on. It's because you know, the, there's lack of access accessibility of that, you know, those kind of sensors that can be used to detect you know, those kind of biomarkers. So we wanted to develop a point of care biosensor that can be used same as I think the ELISA uh, do. I mean, like I think we can detect you know, different types of biomarkers associated with like cancer or heart disease or something like that. So this is our kind of prototype design. I'll pass this around now. I mean, this is kind of the thing of the. Uh, not, this is not, you know, working prototype. I mean, this is just in you know, a mock system that you know, we created that you know, to kind of that you know, the match that you know, the what we wanted to. Uh, how we want to build and how we want to test it. So I will pass this around so they can look into it. Like, you know, the, I haven't go over that, you know, what's inside there. You know, I'm going to go over that along with that in my presentation. But mainly that, you know, the, the key aspect of our design is low cost. It has to be low cost to be point of care biosensor. If you need to pay $100,000 to own that, you know, the point of care biosensor, you are not going to own it, right? You don't have money for that $100,000. Same thing, you know, if you don't want to bring, I mean, we cannot provide that to the third world country because they don't have that much money. It has to be low cost. But it still has to be that the high sensitivity so that you can provide some meaningful information. It has to be easy to use. You don't want to be trained for that in one month, right, to use that in certain biosensor, right? Do you? You want? Right? I mean, it has to be easy to use. I think that if you press button and put your blood there, and that should be it. And the whole, everything should be done you know, automatically that, you know, the, uh, in the system. And it has to stand alone. You know, you don't want to you know, hook things here and you know put that the tube inside at you know, the certain point and then you know you have, before if there's a lot of other process before you do the task, that'll be uh, painful and you know it won't be good for the point of care biosensor. It has to be portable and multiplexable. Multiplexability mm -hmm. means we do not want to use your blood for one detection, meaning that you know the, we want to use one blood, one drop of your blood to detect variety of the you know, possible disease. Like, one drop of blood can check that you know the you know breast cancer and lung cancer and everything together, okay, including the heart attack and whatever that you know the possible disease you may have. So this is our design. We have two laser dyed at two different wavelengths. One is 780 nanometer and 850 nanometer. The laser dyed is generating light at that wavelength, and that the light coming out from that laser dyed is kind of diverging. It's kind of going, kind of getting bigger and bigger as it propagates. In, uh, in front of the laser dyed, we have collimator to make the, be the, the, the beam size after the collimator to be certain size. So we have certain size of the beam coming out from the laser dyed by combining with the uh, collimator. And those collimated beam you know, coming into the, you know, the, this side, which you know, we are using the beam speeder, which is used to combine these two beams together. And those two beams going through the, you know, the structure, which is called optical cavity. And that optical cavity is uh, the key part of that in our sensor. And after that, that, the result will be read by CMOS camera. This optical cavity have to be uh, engineered 
could be the, you know, the biosensor. And this is our final design using the uh, uh, software, you know, the simulation programming. We, want, we have to have 13 nanometer silver thin film mirror here. So this is, this black line here is that, you know, the 13 nanometer silver, silver thin film. What the, the 13 nanometer silver thin film is doing is that that becomes partially reflecting mirror, okay? So when the, the light beam at those wavelengths is getting into this interface here, part of the light will be reflected and part of the light will be transmitted. And the, the distance between this black two, those two black lines, which is that in silver layer uh, meters, uh, is the 2.53 micron. And we create another uh, very thin layer of 100 nanometer PDMS uh, to actually uh, functionalize a surface with a uh, biological uh, receptor layers so that they can be used to detect certain biomarkers. What happened here is that then as we introduce our sample, fluid sample there, as the fluid sample contained that in certain biomarker of interest, the biomarker will getting into that, you know, the, uh, the receptor molecule there and then bind to the receptor molecule and that become like that, you know, creating another thin film on top of that. We call that sensing layer. Having the sensing layer, a certain uh, thing is there, that will change the characteristic of the, you know, the reserve. And by reading the, the change, we can determine the concentration of certain biomarkers. That's our design. Before we getting into there, the thing is we need to talk about what is our per cavity and how it works. How many of you are majoring uh, engineering physics? Yes. <laughs> Only one? <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be tough then. I mean, <laughs> but anyway, the thing is the, uh, so what happens is there, I mean, the uh, simplified version is this. We have partially reflecting meter, and the light comes in into uh, this one side of the meter. As I mentioned, that in a part of the light will be reflected, and part of the light getting into the film. That makes sense, right? And then the light coming, uh, traveling inside of cavity, and meet another partially reflecting meter. And at that point, part of the light again reflected back, and part of the light going in, going out of that in the cavity. And this light, reflected light, going back again, and then reflection again in from this partially reflecting mirror. So what happens here that the light is going to go in, uh, traveling back and forth and back and forth inside of cavity, and then split um, uh, coming out that in a little bit of that in the uh, portion of the light toward this output side for each round trip of light. Okay, and combining them all together, if they are in phase, as I mean, there will be in some wavelengths it becomes in phase. What that means is that you know, the, at that wavelength that you know, the amplitude is really high. And for certain wavelengths which is not in phase, that you know, for those output light, then they become all you know uh, cancel out each other and destructively interfere. So that becomes eventually near to zero. So that create kind of resonance curve like this. We have this kind of resonance characteristic and this peak here called the resonance peak, and that can be calculated this calculated by this mathematical expression here. But we don't have to go over that then how we can use this optical cavity as a biosensor. Let's think about this. You know, this is that, you know, the optical cavity again, the same as before. So we have this kind of that, you know, resonance characteristic. We have that, you know, resonance peak right there. What if we have another layer created in this part due to the binding event of the biomarker to the receptor molecule like this? then we, met, we can see that there is a resonance curve change, meaning that the resonance peak shifted to a certain side, okay? So by actually monitoring that how much peak, the resonance peak has been shifted, you can actually that they correlate that with the concentration biomarker. Another way to do it is that you know, if you are detecting certain wavelength, like 50, 50 nanometer in this case, you can imagine that you know, the, upon having that, you know, another binding layer there, which we call the sensing layer again, you can imagine that you know, the power change upon that, the, uh, having that you know, additional layer there. In this case, at 50, 50 nanometer, initially that, you know, your power is this much, but the power drops that much as you have that, you know, another layer created. So we can, you can uh, approach, approach two ways that, you know, to use this optical cavity structure for the biosensor. One, monitoring the peak shift. Two, monitoring the optical power for certain wavelength. But both have problems. 
the problem for the, you know, the detecting the shift of the, you know, the resonance peak is the cost. To, to measure very accurately that in a small change of the, you know, the resonance peak, you have to pay a lot of money to buy the very high cost of spectrometer and also tunable lasers. So that's not good. I mean, it can be a biosensor, but we cannot use it for the point of care biosensor. If you want to measure that in the optical power change, this change is relatively very, very small. So a lot of noise I mean, that's involved there, so you cannot really measure, measure it accurately with that, you know, the, by monitoring the optical power. So those are the problems. So we, what we propose here is that you know, we like this approach that in monitoring optical power to determine the concentration biomarker. But we doesn't like the, the low sensitivity. So <laughs> we think you know, how we can improve the sensitivity without losing that you know, benefit using the, you know, the monitoring the optical power, which is low cost. So we propose, actually, why don't we use a true laser? So this is the resonance curve of the, you know, the optical cavity we designed. I mean, I gave you the parameter that, you know, a few slides ago, that you know, the 2.53 uh, micron cavity with a uh, 13 nanometer silver layer. For that case, that, you know, the, this is the resonance curve we can get. And this resonance structure is engineered to have this specific resonance curve uh, so that we have <laughs> a uh, certain characteristic for a certain wavelength laser diode we can use. We do not want to develop a new laser diode that's new wavelengths because that will cost a lot. So to save money, we want to use a laser diode we can easily buy. 780 nanometers, 850 nanometer laser diode is really, really a low cost laser diode. It just costs about 15 bucks, 15 dollars. So we know that there is a cheap laser diode and we want to use it. And to use those, we have to engineer that our cavity structure so that we can put those wavelengths at certain points. So what do we want to accomplish is this. As I showed you from the previous slide, upon that, you know, the binding event at the sensor uh, sensing layer, I showed you that you know, the resonance curve shift to the one side, right? Which side? Is it going to that side or that side? Which direction? Going to that direction. Then what happened for the optical power for that eight, eight, uh, 780 nanometer laser diode? The power will go up or down. Go up, right? Because the resonance curve is going to that way, right? What about this uh, 850 nanometer laser diode? Optical power going to going down, right? And now that you know, this is that you know, the actual efficiency that you know, the uh, simulated from the you know, software. As we can imagine that this is a sampling layer thing is equivalent to the binding layer there, and I simulate that from the you know, zero to twenty nanometer there. And efficiency, which is equivalent to the power, for 780 nanometer, as you can imagine, that you know, that power is slightly going up, but really small. As you can imagine, that you know, for 850 nanometer, the power is slightly going down, but small change. How we can actually emphasize it? I mean, amplify that you know that kind of signal change for this kind of sensing that thing is change. So we actually introduce that in you know, a scale differential value. Equation. This is that is the thing of the new part. I mean, the optical cavity based sensor have been used I mean, for a long time, and it is been, uh, there for a long time. But this is the first time that you know, they uh, propose this approach to improve that thing you know, the uh, sensitivity. And this is the result of that. This is the differential value as of sensing layer thickness. As you can see here, for the same sensing layer thickness change, that you know, the change for the differential value compared to that you know, other two powers, much significant. So this is the table. Showing that the result for, two, uh, for the sensing layer thing is from the 0 to 20 nanometer. The delta P1, meaning that in the power 1 change for the 780 nanometer is only uh, 0.025. Delta P2 is minus 0.061, but delta eta, which is that in a differential value change for this sensing layer thing is, is at least double that in the change compared to that in those power change. And also, I want to emphasize that you know, this can be the multiplexable detection because. As I mentioned at the beginning when I explained that in you know, our design, I told you that in you know, later it will be coming out and then collimated at certain size, right? And that collimated beam doesn't have to be used for the single detection. What I mean is this: this is a cross section of the, you know, the laser diode. We can actually place at the different receptor molecules in a different area, okay? And then this can be used to detect in you know, different types of diseases at the same time. So this is multiplexable detection. So. We think that you know, the we we have idea you know we have the you know, the uh, we have idea to improve the sensitivity, 
and we can build everything at really low cost, and we have, we can accomplish the multi flexibility. And so we are trying to build you know the uh, detection system and then try to demonstrate that our design. And this is our testing setup here. So 780 nanometer, 850 nanometer, and beam splitter that use that you know, combine things together. That traveling through it, there's a mirror here, and then we create that in you know, our sample, which is cavity sample there, and then we have a CMOS camera as you know we discussed before. And how much this the entire system uh, cost will be? What do you think? Huh? Hundred. Oh well, it's a little bit more than that. <laughs> Sorry. Because CMOS camera is a little bit expensive, and that's the main problem. That in the total cost is still less than five hundred dollars. So what that means is that you know, they, I mean, you can imagine that you know, we have to invest a lot of money. That later on, that you know, after we successfully complete this project, we may need to ask you more dollars or something like that. But eventually, I can imagine that you know, our final system may cost less than one thousand dollars. I think that you know, that is something you can afford, right? And that you, know, you can, if that is kind of that, you know, the important system for you to monitor your health. The problem is this. We are using very low cost laser diode here. We are not really doing anything, you know, very you know, fancy thing like that. You know, we are not cooling down the CMOS to lower the, you know, the noise or something like that, because we don't want to add too much into it so that we can keep the cost low. But the problem is that you know, the, it's really noisy. So this is a signal we're just getting it for the 700 nanometer wavelength. So this is the intensity as a function of time for 40 minutes. You can see that you know, the signal is keep changing like this. It's kind of a horrible noise. And noise sources are laser diode and CMOS detector and every, everything. So we introduced that, you know, the way to reduce the noise. So we actually that, you know, used the, the initial frame so that we can actually subtract that, the initial frame um, from the data frame. And also we do that in you know, some normalization process uh, using that, you know, one reference point for, uh, for each frame to reduce the noise. I mean, you don't have too much worry about it, but eventually what it happens is this. After we do that, you know, the, uh, that noise reduction process, data process, as you can see here, it is much, much better than before, right? Can you tell? You agree with that? Okay, so this signal can also go through that, you know, the low-pass filtering to even re reduce that, you know, the uh, noise level. But we want to compare that in you know, a standard deviation because that is indicator of the, you know, how noisy it is. So without any uh, data processing, the standard deviation is 11.29. But after the, uh, the normalization process, we found that our standard deviation reduced significantly to the 2.71 to 77. And after low pass filtering, basically what we want is the differential value. So we do the performance of the differential calculation, and this is the result. We accomplished with that in a standard deviation to be 0 0.0041. This is the result for that in you know, the test setup I showed you. Okay, with the less than five hundred dollars of the testing setup, this is the standard deviation. This is the noise level. So what does noise level really mean for us, for this biosensor application? Let's take a look at it. I mean, what does that really mean? So this graph shows that in you know, a differential value as a sensing near thing. We saw this before. I want to show you that you know, the near the zero point, it looks like this. You know, at zero sensing near thing is that you know, the differential value is supposed to be zero. But what this data means, actually, without any sensing near thing is, your measured value can be this because of standard deviation, because of noise. So what does it really mean? Meaning, if you wanted to detect small increase of the sensing layer thing, it's about like maybe one picometer. Okay? If that is within the standard deviation range, you cannot accurately determine whether that is from the one picometer change or from the, from the noise, right? So that will be the problem. Then, you know, what is actually measurable uh, sensing layer thing is we can say for given noise there, which is this, which is at, you know, about one standard deviation away from the data point, right? Then what is that? For our case, that is 532 picometer. Meaning we cannot really accurately detect change in the sensing layer thing is due to the binding event of the biological molecule, biomarkers, the receptor molecule, within this range, 532 picometer. Is it a problem? Yes. I mean, it would be better if we have that, you know, the less noise so that you know, we can detect even small change. But that's what it is you know, with our low-cost system. So we have to think about what does it really mean for us. So we have minimum detectable sensing layer thing is we can refine this 532 picometer. This is from actual measured data. And the, uh, the study shows that you know, the, this 
Meaning of detectable sensing your things is equivalent to the you know, biomolecular density. Remember that. I mean, this is very important uh, number you know, for the next few slides. Can be that an equivalently 532 picogram per millimeter squared. Meaning our system can detect any biomolecule if that biomolecule has a density of this, 532 picogram per millimeter squared. Okay? What does that mean? What that means is when we need to think about what is that, you know, the measurement accuracy. And I mentioned to you that when I talk about ELISA, the detection limit for the ELISA for the PSA is one picomolar. And I say that you know, the, our system needs to be high sensitivity comparable to that. So we need to compare it. And we want to see that and how we can accomplish that. So we have to think about you know, a few different things. You know, first of all, let's fix sensor area to be one millimeter square. How much target biomarkers we need so that we can actually detect accurately? Because your minimum detectable density is 500. 132 picogram per millimeter square. We need at least 532 picogram of the biomarker in your sample. And assuming all these 532 picogram of biomarker reach to that you know, the sensor region, region there, and then you know bind to that you know, the receptor molecule, then we can detect it. Does it make sense? All right. Then, what if we have that much of the biomarker in one microliter uh, sample volume. That can be translated to be, that is the concentration of 532 nanogram per mil. But what if we have the sample volume of one milliliter that has you know, the uh, 532 picogram and eventually that, you know, that all getting into the sensor region and stay there and binding to it. Then what is the concentration? That is. 532 picogram per milliliter. You can see that you know, the concentration can be determined by the sample volume, right? That might be the reason why you have to draw a lot of blood when you go to the you know, doctor, doctor's office, because that, you know, that will increase the possibility that you know, the sensitivity, uh, the measure of concentration. So that's one thing. You have to think about that you know, the sample volume will affect that, you know, the, what, what could be that the measure of concentration. This is something we can measure. This is a measure of concentration, meaning that you know, if we have the one milliliter sample volume, and if the certain biomarker has this concentration, 532 picogram per mil, then our device can detect it. Another thing, this is something we cannot change for our, for our system, you know, 532 picogram per millimeter square, which is the detective density there. Another, another thing we can think about is that, you know, what if we can, re if we reduce the sensor region? Previous slide that you know, we fixed the sensor region to be one millimeter square. But what if that you know, we actually reduce the sensor region but fix that the sample volume? Why do we have to fix sample volume? Because I don't want to draw a lot of blood. Okay? We want just single finger prick. The average volume of blood from the single, prick, uh, single uh, finger prick is from 10 microliter <coughs> to 25 uh, microliter. So this is kind of lower end, right? In that case, to have this minimum detectable dens density, we need 532 picogram if our sensor, sensor area is one millimeter squared. That makes sense? If we reduce that the sensor area to accomplish this, this density here, what we need is only 5.32 picogram. What that means that in terms of concentration is 0.532 nanogram per mil. If we reduce it further to that in a sensor area to be 100 microns square, our detectable concentration becomes really small. So you can see now, let's say that in our biosensor to be a point of care biosensor, so we need to use that in a single finger prick, which could uh, produce that in a 10 microliter. And using this sensitivity, if we wanted to accomplish this level of that in a level of that in a detection concentration, then our sensor area has to be 100 microliter. So it is all about the density. So therefore, what it means is this. If we have the one millimeter square of the sensor area, uniformly coding every, everywhere with a certain density, that is equivalent to that. You know, as you continue to reduce that the sensor area, because what we carry is a density, it doesn't really change anything. I mean, as long as we can actually accurately monitoring certain sensor area. So that's something we are looking at it right now. 
So this is graph showing that you know, the amount of biomolecules in femtogram as a function of sensor area, describing PSA, you know, which is process-specific antigen, uh, assuming that you know, the sample volume to be fixed to be 10 microliter from the single finger prick. What happens see is this. If your sensor area is 9,300 micrometers square, minimum detectable concentration is 0.5 nanogram per mil. You can imagine that you know, the S you reduce that, you know, the minimum detectable concentration uh, going down and down, the sensor area has to be also going small, getting smaller and smaller. And you can accomplish that the 0.1 nanogram per mil concentration if your sensor area is 1,800 uh, micrometers square. And that is, a, uh, and for 0.034 nanogram per mil, which is equivalent to the one picomolar detection of the in ELISA, we need three, 600, 639 micrometer <coughs> sensing area. And can we accomplish that? I believe so. We haven't demonstrated yet, and that's what we are doing right now. And this is our idea, and that is the, uh, where I can get the, I, I got my NSF career grant. This is 400K for five years, starting June 1st, 2014. So as you can see, we are very uh, early stage right now. So we have idea, we have design, and we think that you know, we can create that, you know, some meaningful point of care device, and that can be used uh, you know, as a consumer product that you can own at home and then you can monitor your health. And uh, NSF, you know, support that research there. And then we, uh, using this uh, grant, I was able to purchase that, you know, some major equipment so that we can, I can uh, create that, you know, the uh, features we want to create. So this is you know, the microfabrication facility we are building. I mean, not, you won't be exactly like this. It's not, there are a lot of fancy uh, systems here, but that, you know, I just show you, that, you know, what it, we like. But all the system here is not supposed to be here. I mean, those are very expensive. But total investment combined with the my grant with the you know, engineering, we have we invest one seventy thousand dollars there, and then we will have the you know, the clinic here, and that allow the you know, the uh, returning student to experience that in you know, the microfabrication processes and devices. So this is the you know, the layout of the you know, clinic here. Basically, we are going to have the mask aligner, wet station, and sputtering system, and those are the key systems here. And there are a few things that allow me to make the system I just proposed it to you guys. So there are two projects we are working on right now. Number one project is demonstration of high sensitivity detection. We want to make problems simple. And then want to see that in our sensor really that high sensitivity as we proposed. So this is the, you know, the detection system I, just sh I, I showed you before. And instead of that, you know, we actually do that in bio detection, at this time we want to use that, you know, the certain known standard fluid to demonstrate the sensitivity of our system. We decide to use that in refractive index fluid, meaning that you know, this fluid has different refractive index. What does that mean is that you know, if the cavity I described before is filled with a different refractive index material there, that will change resonance characteristic, and our system can detect you know, those changes, and then we can demonstrate that you know, how accurately we can detect those kind of things. So this is the video actually that you know, the, uh, how we build a micro sensor, a biosensor for that purpose there. So we create that, you know, the holes on this uh, slide, and then we are cutting that, you know, the silver on both sides, and, and then we put that, you know, the, uh, another pattern there that makes the cavity, because at the end of the day, we have to have a one, uh, 2.5 micron gap between two partially refracting meter, and this structure will allow us to have the accurate distance that creates an optical cavity and then we cut in you know, a plug in that you know, the uh, tubes there so that we can introduce fluid into that you know, the sample here. And the fluid will flow through it. And this fluid will change depending on that, you know, what refractive index fluid you are using. So we are going to change the refractive index here. And then we are going to measure it to, sh to demonstrate to demonstrate uh, the, the sensitivity of our, of our system. But this is all, all like that the system on the uh, on optics table. And we need to have that in a syringe pump to control the fluid there. And we are using this sample fluid. But we want to basically demonstrate, I mean, this is simulation research I didn't go over, but, but basically that, you know, this is what we expected. And we wanted to actually that, you know, demonstrate with that, you know, this sample fluid here. Another project is actually we want to uh, prototyping a standalone system, like you know, the system is now you know, you know, going around right now. And that, this is what that's supposed to be. I mean, that we are getting there. I mean, it's not exactly like that. But we have the laser diode, and we have uh, with the enclosure here, and then we have microfluidic system there, and then we have microcontroller and display. Why we need to have a CD-based microfluidic system? That is because 
in previous pro, you know, a system here, we have that you know, this syringe pump to flow our sample fluid into the sensor region. But this is external component. We cannot have that for our point of care by sensor. We need to have the certain system that can actually automatically deliver the sample from one point to the sensor region. We need to do some kind of way to do it. And what we choose is that you know, the CD-based microfluidics. CD-based microfluidics is simply what that means is you have port that you can introduce your sample there. And then we will rotate this CD, like CD player. Rotate it. So you introduce your sample here. And then as you rotate it, what, what will happen? There's only one engineering physics student here. But, but you can imagine that then as you're spinning it, there is that, you know, the force, right? And that force leads that, you know, your fluid getting into the sensing region here. And then you are going to read and analyze it. Okay? So we can do without external component. And that is, I think, the purpose of this. So we are working on it for that. And this is the video how we actually create that, you know, this kind of CD-based microfluidic system. Same way, we start from the, you know, the punch the hole that in one substrate, and we start from another substrate without nothing there. We put the silver there, and then we create another layer, thin layer. You know, I mentioned the PDMS before, but if you don't remember it, there's another layer there. And then we put that in you know, another SU8, a layer that, that creating the gap of the, you know, the, the, the cavity size there. And then we are going to expose that with a certain pattern there that leave that you know, the certain pattern we want that becomes eventually the fluidic channel there. And then after that, we are going to functionalize, meaning with the bioreceptor molecules that specifically designed for certain biomarkers. And then after that, we are going to combine them all together, and that becomes our cavity system, CD microfluidic system. And then we are going to get into the system there, that you know, the mock system you have there, but eventually that we are going to have fan there, and then we can control that, you know, the fan speed, spin speed there. And then as we flow that, you know, the uh, spin speed at a certain rate, uh, then, you know, like that, you know, we just show you that, you know, the, we introduce a sample there. As we rotate that, you know, the 800 RPM, we can send that, you know, the fluid sample to that, you know, sensing region, and then we can do that, you know, for the processing there. So that's the second project what we are doing right now. So in conclusion, as I mentioned in this project at the beginning, all the diagnosis is really, really important. The key of effective treatment of diseases such as cancers. And point of care is the solution, in my opinion. Whether my project will be successful you know, within a short time or period, or that you know, somebody else you know, currently working. I mean, of course, I'm not the only one working on this kind of project. There are a lot of the competition around the world. Anyone, I think that they, uh, within 50, 50 years, maybe 20 years, maybe 10 years, that you know, there will be something that you can actually own at home and then monitoring your health, like that, you know, the, what you are currently doing at you know, the uh, doctor's office. And that will change medical diagnosis field. And that will transform everything. And to accomplish that kind of bio, uh, point of care diagnosis, we need a total biosensor. And that's where we are going. As I show you that, you know, the, our design and how sensitive it could be. And this is that, you know, the prototype for that you know, standalone one system. And using the plenum, you are going to build. So this is my acknowledgment. You know, this research is funded by NSF and also that in funded through that in the faculty scholarship grant. And these are uh, my former graduate students graduate uh, uh, working on this project. And I have currently five graduate students working on uh, this project. We have two senior design teams working on this project, and this team is at the current team working on this project. And that's all I have today. Any questions? Well, thank you. For our speaker, but with the CDs, uh, would you have to dispose of each one and get new ones for different tests? Or yes. You, there's no way to make them like reusable. At this time, I don't have an idea to make it reusable. But usually, the antigen-antibody combination is not really uh, compatible anymore. Once you have binding happens, that stay there. So at this time, we have to throw away. And this is kind of disposable system. If you're reducing the sensor area, does that reduce also your multiple flexibility? Uh, no, uh, that actually you know, the doesn't change because you know, the, I don't change the beam size. Multiplexibility is determined by the beam size and what is you know, the sensing region for each biomarker. So reducing that in you know, the sensor region itself doesn't really, I mean, it doesn't mean that the sensor region doesn't mean that you know, the beam size is detectable area. That is only for that, you know, the area assigned for certain biomarkers.
Iceland uses serum, which they are not necessarily containing cells, but this system, like you're going to give the two of these having different kinds of cells in the scalp test for interaction for the reduction. How do you think that? That is a really good question. The question is that you know, the, uh, I'm going to use that in the whole body instead of the same serum. And how I can actually you know, the, uh, remove that you know, all germs from the, you know, the whole body and then only use that, you know, the, uh, something meaningful? Uh, the answer is that you know, the, at this time I don't have a plan yet, but that, you know, the, there are people working on the you know, CD-based microfluidics, and they introduce that in different filters and different things, that, you know, different structures. They're filtering out that, you know, those cells that are you know, unusual things, and they only bring that, you know, the serum of plasma to the sensing region. So that's cool. Well, if not, remember we'll be over in the, I think it's in the Joyce room, the corner cafe. We'll find us over there. And I'll thank our speaker one more time. Good job. Good job. Thank you. I'll come to uh, Lightboard. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. See you there then. Yes. It's very interesting.